All right. You know, I'm, glad, I'm glad you mentioned that. Good evening. This is the Tuesday, February 8th, 2005 business meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. Everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any adjustments for uh, the agenda? We do. We have an addendum, which I hope there were copies up back. Um, there are. But there were. Um, and we have two additional retirement notices, which we'll get to under announcements of, of uh, retirements. So we'll add this item to new business. Um, letter F. And the other re retirements or resignations? Uh, retirements. Will be handled on the 5A. Mm -hmm. Any other adjustments? All right. Approval of January school board minutes. Can I have a motion? <coughs> Thank you, Elaine. Uh, I move that we accept the uh, January uh, school board minutes that were enclosed in our packet. Second. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we'll use Trish for the record. Um, any conversation? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? 7-0. Thank you. On to our high school students. Student. <laughs> uh, lots going on in the high school during the uh, winter time. Uh, we actually recently had uh, elections for new SAC president in the school because we changed the system uh, for how long, for when the uh, term is for the SAC president because usually toward the end of a uh, <coughs> The SAC president's usually senior, and usually towards the end of the senior year, they kind of lose interest in school and working hard. <coughs> and so uh, now the uh, president is going to be the second half of a junior year and the first half of a senior year, and we'll have elections at the mid-year. Uh, so and who that is just happened. Sorry. And uh, we had four candidates running, and Mary Cox uh, ended up winning, and she's the new SAC president. Um, uh, Operation Smile, which you might know, it's a, uh, a program that was started by a couple uh, students who are now seniors, uh, which raises money uh, <coughs> to uh, improve dentistry for impoverished, impo impoverished areas where um, kids don't have very good dentistry. And uh, they're doing a fundraiser where you can buy roses for three dollars or you can buy a rose and then have it sent to someone in the school and they do that every year and it's kind of a tradition and so that's happening just this week uh, winter sports are coming to a close uh, uh, we're heading into playoffs WMC state championships so that's always an exciting time um, Winterfest is also coming up which was started by Mr. Shedd a couple of years ago and uh, that includes the winter dance, which is an 80s dance. And, but because of complications with the DJ, it's being moved back to March, but it's coming. <coughs> and during Winterfest, we do a lot of fun things. There's a faculty versus students sock and mitten basketball game, which the whole school goes to watch. And they're wearing mittens and socks, and it's pretty funny. And, uh, there are snow sculpture, sculpture competitions and a 3v3 hockey tournament on a, the Lions Field Pond and hallway decoration competitions. And so everyone's looking forward to that. And also construction's still going well. Uh, students can kind of follow the progress at lunch every day. You know, you see 
what's going on. There's a wall there now, and uh, the additions being built. And it's pretty interesting. It seems to be going well, and uh, everything seems to be all set. Great. ESAC, did they also elect other offices? Or is it just the president? Uh, just the president. Okay. I'm Great. still with my job. Thanks a lot. Middle school. I'm Nora. Um, and I'm Elsa Mullen. Okay. Everybody returned from a weekend in a great mood. Why? Well, the seventh and eighth graders had a Valentine dance on Friday. Carnations were sold, and we made the $100 we need to sponsor an orphanage in Africa. In addition, many were in a great mood because of the Patriots' victory in the Super Bowl. In the eighth grade, students are getting anxious because teachers are starting to make placements for high school courses. Also, many students were given the opportunity to take the SATs a few weeks back. On the 17th of February, many students in the 8th grade will be taking the National Spanish exam. In the 5th grade, students are making valentines and sending them to troops in Iraq. The higgins Solander team is trying to collect at least 100 valentines to give to Preble Street Resource Center. The variety show was on Tuesday the 1st. Many attended and enjoyed the show. Also in entertainment news, Practice for the play has started. We are lucky enough to have a student teacher from USM helping with our music program. Also, both eighth grade jazz bands will be attending a jazz competition on the 16th, which we will be <coughs> having in the high school. Midwinter sports such as swimming and indoor track have started. And that's it. Um, with February break coming quickly, the Cape Elizabeth Middle School is a busy place. The first trimester is over, and we're halfway through the second uh, trimester with progress reports handed out on Friday. First sports, the girls' basketball has finished, and now the boys are back, <coughs> and the Nordic ski team is, is um, skiing with they meet just today. Also, track and swimming are starting soon. As you um, may know, the seventh grade is raising money for Operation Smile, and their most recent fundraiser was last Friday, which they had a hat day. Um, and you would pay $1 if you wanted to wear a hat. They raised uh, $380 with a total of already uh, $700 for Operation Smile. Last Tuesday, there was a talent sh uh, two talent shows held in the middle school. Um, with having seen them, or seeing one of them, um, I was extremely pleased. The student council <coughs> held the uh, Valentine's Day dance on Friday, um, last Friday. And the student council is uh, now planning a fifth and sixth grade uh, social um, that will be a carnival theme. Uh, we recently held a clothing drive with, uh, for the homeless that was started by Jonathan Bass, a member of the student council, and um, are going to be planning soon the um, Spirit Week. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Were you guys at the dance? Yes. Was the last song Stairway to Heaven? Yeah. <laughs> Great taste. <coughs> Communications. Anyone? Okay. Announcement of retirements, Bob? Uh, yes, we have a few. Um, there was a, a copy of the letter that went home to uh, families of uh, Ms. Martin Weigel's room um, regarding Rindy's retirement, um, and uh, we wish her our best. Um, I'm sure we'll be talking more about each of these um, to get toward the end of the year. Um, but that one was immediate. Uh, the next one is a tough one, Nancy. Um, we all have a copy of Nancy Hutton's letter. Uh, if anybody in town doesn't know already that Nancy has chosen to retire at the end of the year, um, I'd be surprised. Um, Nancy has been here for 25 years, 15 of them as principal, and uh, will be sorely missed, but we, uh, we do respect your right to retire, Nancy. <laughs> he does. <laughs> Uh, we have two more that were not, um, had not been received when the package came out. Um, one is uh, Judy Liberty. And I will distribute copies of her letter. 
Judy has taught at uh, the high school for 20 years um, in uh, the foreign language department and will be retiring at the end of the year as well. And um, the other is Charlotte Musrol, um, who will also be retiring at the end of the school year. So um, I wanted you to have those and public to be aware of those. Thank you, Bob. Um, May I ask a question? Um, Charlotte Musrol, what is her position? Uh, elementary. Grade two. Grade, grade two. two. Thank you. Okay. Resignations, Bob? Our resignations were in the package, and I believe there were three. Um, uh, Bridget Del Vecchio, uh, who was new at the um, high school this year. Uh, Michael Burns, who was uh, new at the uh, middle school this year, both in life skills rooms. And uh, Patty LaFerrier, who was an, an ed tech, am I correct there? Yes. An ed tech um, in the special ed department. Um, have all announced their resignations. Um, we have posted those positions. We are advertising for them um, and are considering, if necessary, um, some other arrangements, but uh, we'll see what we get for candidates at this time of the year. Great. At this point of the agenda, we have uh, time available, comments from the public on non-agenda items. I didn't think so. So we'll move on. Uh, Bob, superintendent's report. Yeah, um, we did get an issue of the view out on January 20th. Um, that's since our last meeting. Um, just to highlight some of the things that are going on in the system, hopefully everybody did receive that. Um, we are excited about the Pond Cove Kindergarten Wing Open House coming up on Sunday. Um, uh, we do have a draft for the board members of the uh, program for that that you could pass down. Um, it, it should be a, a good time. I was over there yesterday morning, as was Tom and, uh, and uh, Kelly and everybody else, um, as the kindergartners arrived for their very first day um, at their new building. I think their only disappointment was that the mud was frozen as they tromped through to get to the building, but uh, they, uh, they seemed to be in great spirits, and uh, the, the teachers did a, did a super job of getting the place ready to, to, uh, for them. So um, our thanks to everybody and our congratulations to everybody, and uh, we look forward. The open house will be from 1 to 3 on Sunday afternoon, this coming Sunday, and uh, uh, other e the actual... Um, Ceremony will be held at 2 o'clock um, in the, the lobby of uh, Pond Cove School. Um, let me just I'll also uh, hand pictures down um, on the high school. We'll start them at that end and bring them this way. Um, the high school construction, um, the locker rooms are partially done at this point. Um, there is probably a third of the tiling is completed. completed um, some of the painting in the locker rooms are completed, um, so they are making progress. Um, they had promised those to us by the end of February, and we're, we're still in doubts about that, but uh, um, hopefully not too long after, Jeff. Um, the uh, the uh, cafeteria addition is coming along. It's closed in. Um, they are, are uh, beginning work inside of it. The, uh, second floor, you'll see a picture of the life skills room, which is almost complete. Um, they had some plumbing issues they had to work on up there, and that slowed things down. Um, the library um, section is now being used, um, and you'll see some of our own workers in the, uh, the, the former kindergarten rooms as they try to get them ready for high school students, uh, because there will be classes moving to some of those classrooms. Um, so that uh, they will be occupied pretty quickly so that we can free up other spaces, uh, the math classrooms, I think, to, uh, to, uh, for the front, front of the building renovations. Um, and finally, some of you have heard um, there has been a convicted sex offender identified as living in Cape Elizabeth. 
Um, we had calls from um, some of the uh, parents of children in the neighborhood um, about changing some bus, uh, changing at least one bus pickup. Uh, Sue and I went out today, Sue Weatherby and I went out and looked at that and said yes, we will add one additional bus stop on at least a temporary basis to uh, so that we, uh, nobody is, is out walking for any longer than they have to be in, in that area. Um, if people have not heard or if people are interested, this is on the, uh, the website under the police page and uh, you can pick it up there. Um, and I believe that's all, unless there are questions. Questions for Bob? <laughs> Bob, can um, you just take a minute to kind of describe what's happening at the high school with the portables? Um, I've had some people um, asking questions about now that the kindergarten's gone, what's going to be happening with those rooms and do we need those portables? And I think it's a general feeling out there. Well, um, that they're going to disappear. <laughs> they're not going to disappear quickly. Um, the, they were planned into the program from the beginning as classrooms. We have not had to change those classrooms yet. The people who started in them the beginning of the year are still there and we anticipate will be throughout the year. Um, the kindergarten rooms that were freed up, as I said, um, some of those have renovations that are going to be done in them and so they will be torn apart in the very near future. Others will be, begin to be used for to house some of the math classrooms which are on the opposite wing in that front part of the building um, because they are, have, are, will be undergoing renovations right away. So um, there is a, an ongoing, um, I, I, Jeff, you must have a, something like a monopoly game in your office as to who's moving where. But um, that's pretty much um, what we do on a week-to-week -week and month-to-month -month basis as to what rooms can we free up, who can we move into those, and what rooms can we have work done in at this time. And so that will continue um, into the summer at least. Now, I don't know what the, the plan is for next fall. And maybe, Jeff, you could speak to that. Um, <clears throat> We haven't really mapped out exactly what's going to be happening in the summer, but one of the things that's very clear is that there will continue to be work that will be going on in some of the classrooms in the school. I mean, there are updates that are going to be next fall and into January when the project is scheduled to be done. Um, the work is likely to be centered on the investment technology and arts for at that time. So there will continue to be a new swing space until all of those classrooms are but we are, you know, we are freeing up, as Bob says, um, next week we are working in three math classrooms. Um, they're going into the kindergarten way. Um, shortly thereafter, we'll be making the last of the math classroom, which is, uh, is also scheduled to be renovated. But that depends on the work on the second floor once the vice coach work is completed and that sort of thing. So I'm not agreeing that there won't be Project. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. School reports. That's a good segue. High school principals report, Jeff. <coughs> First of all, I want to say that. Um, we miss the kindergartners. <laughs> <laughs> we had a fun, fun send off for the kindergartners last week, um, and it was, and there were a lot of high school students were involved in that. And there are going to be pictures appearing in the Courier and the Current and some other places. Um, um, it was especially poignant because this year's seniors are the first class to have attended the kindergarten. So we had a lot of the seniors who were involved who were the first kids as, as five-year-olds. Um, saying goodbye to their counterparts who are now um, the last, last students who attended the kindergarten. So we, we, are, we do miss them because uh, they were really a humanizing influence on the high school. Not that we're not a human institution, but it, it just introduces such a different uh, sort of feel. Um, I actually wanted to follow the lead that Nancy Hutton started last, last time <coughs> to talk about the, her, her principal's report uh, because you've heard from me about laptops 
you've heard from me about learning results, um, you've heard about accreditation. Next week you're going to be hearing about the Achievement Center and a special school board meeting. Um, so I thought that I would change gears a little bit following Nancy's lead um, and talk about s the sort of the softer side of the high school um, and relating, related essentially to the uh, people and the provisions we have in place to try to support the emotional, um, non-academic uh, needs of high school students. Um, and first I wanted to describe the positions that we have uh, of people whose specialty it is to try to make sure that there are supports in place for kids who need supports. Um, and next I wanted to describe very briefly two committees that we have in place, um, comparable to what you've heard about uh, and that exist in both the elementary school and the middle school to give you a sense of the work that goes on related, related um, to that work. Um, first of all is the role of the guidance counselors. Um, and I want to uh, repeat the thanks that I certainly gave last year to the high school and convey the thanks to the guidance counselors for the support that the school board showed last year in the budgetary process to add an additional guidance counselor. Um, if we had not had that position added, we would have um, we would have been had a very, very poor um, student counselor ratio because the school board supported that, we have a much better student counselor ratio um, than we otherwise would have, which is paying dividends for students in the high school. Uh, for the very first time in a number of years, uh, the counselors have started the process of meeting individually with ninth graders. Um, in the past, they really haven't had the chance to do that. Um, and a little bit later, they'll be meeting individually with the 10th graders as well. The year really started with the 9th graders having them take a career interest inventory uh, way back in. It was the very first laptop uh, experience that our 9th graders had. And as the counselors have been meeting the last couple of weeks with 9th graders, they've been using that work to sort of introduce themselves to the 9th graders, to establish some relationships which will pay dividends over the four years that the students are in the high school. So that's been a huge benefit. Um, counselors have also been starting to work with ninth and 10th grade parents, which in the past has not been, um, been able to be a major focus. So last week there was a meeting uh, with ninth and 10th grade parents. Uh, it was a quality meeting I'm discu in discussions with the counselors about whether we need to move that meeting next year to an evening meeting because uh, the counselors have been very successful recently in recent years getting huge turnouts for 11th and 12th grade parents with morning meetings, but this particular meeting was not as well attended. Uh, we want to make sure we're hitting everybody as much as possible. And the counselors, because they have more time to um, address the needs of all kids, they are also able to help out our social workers um, sort of in a triage way of trying to make sure directly servicing kids who have some social and emotional needs, um, but kids who may not need quite the ongoing intensive level of support that our two social workers are able to provide. So it's made a huge, it's made a big difference. Um, it's paying dividends, solid relationships are being, uh, are being formed, um, and, and kids we hope will feel welcome and, and encouraged and open uh, when they go into the high school in the guidance office in the future that they'll know who they're coming to see uh, and those relationships will be there. There are two social workers who work in the high school. One is Katie Lisa. Um, and Katie is our regular education social worker. Um, and I wanted to start off by mentioning that she's also sort of, for many people in the high school, for those of you who know Katie, is sort of the resident sage um, for a whole bunch of different issues that you could never possibly fit within a description of job duties. Um, but one of the things that she does that pays some huge dividends in terms of helping us to identify quickly kids who are in need of special assistance is the natural helpers program that um, Katie and Andrea Care, our health teacher, um, jointly advise. It's a program that's been in existence for quite a few years. I'm not sure when it started, but it's been in existence for at least six to eight years, if not longer. Um, and what happens is that the students in the high school are all given a survey um, around about the early winter time, and they nominate students' uh, peers um, whom they recognize as kids who are easy, who are good listeners and easy to talk to. Uh, the kind of kids that other kids in high school feel comfortable going to if they have issues. Um, and so those natural helpers are trained um, by day one um, at a day and a half or two day training uh, that takes place. There's later a follow-up training um, in the spring as well. 
and they're essentially trained to be better listeners. Um, and that program has paid huge dividends. Um, kids this year in particular are more attuned and more sensitive to sort of the emotional, mental health needs of one another, I think, than they ever have been in the past. And the natural helpers are instrumental in sort of bringing to Katie and bringing to Andrea uh, the names of kids who need some assistance. And sometimes it's a matter of bring, actually physically bringing the kids, knocking on Katie's door and bringing them to her office. Um, sometimes it's a matter of giving Katie the name of this is a kid who you might want to see. So in addition to referrals from teachers and referrals from guidance counselors and those sorts of things, the kids themselves are really instrumental in making sure that uh, their fellow students are properly taken, taken care of. Katie also uh, is the un <coughs> unpaid volunteer who advises, as, who advises the volunteer club, uh, which, is a, which actually got its start shortly after September 11th. There was a huge outpouring of, of interest in sort of doing some things connected with September 11th, and that program has sort of taken on a life of its own and does a whole, a whole lot of activities it gets involved in. Katie is also a direct service provider to students of um, counseling needs, um, social and emotional health needs. Um, as I mentioned, she is our, our resident sage. She recently vastly outdrew the school principal who normally goes me, who normally goes to the parent association meetings. I think at the last parent association meeting, which was the night of a blizzard, it was Elaine and me and what, two or three other parents, I think. Um, I'm told, though, that the month before, when Katie Lisa was on the was on the was on the card, there were about 60 parents who showed up um, and wanted to hear what she had to say. So, so parents know her. Parents um, um, welcome her advice and assistance, and um, and uh, and make some good judgments about where to spend their time uh, in parent association meetings as well. Um, Katie is also a, a pro direct provider and facilitator of training for the staff. Um, around mental health issues and around suicide prevention. She has served in that role for a number of years. This year in particular, we've had two trainings that Katie has either directly provided to the staff or has brought people in from outside to do some training with the staff around those issues. Um, and she is remarkably well qualified to serve in that role because, and I really learned that this, this year, uh, before she came to Cape Elizabeth High School, she'd had a number of uh, positions in other school districts uh, but one in particular, she was a crisis manager for a, a, a significant, significantly large um, school system in the Midwest. Um, and so she has all kinds of experiences dealing with a whole host of crises and is very, very well trained uh, to understand the systems that need to be in place to support kids and families as they go through crises. Um, and, and I'm... As I work with Katie, I increasingly become aware that she is also a very crafty operator and can sometimes um, help out kids without them even knowing that, they're, that they are being assisted um, by her. Kids who may not feel comfortable knocking on anybody's door in particular and sharing concerns, but the names have come to Katie through either natural helpers or other students or teachers or administrators or whoever. Um, and Katie can operate behind the scenes very effectively in sort of making sure that there's a web of, a web of support for the kids and, and teachers who are well aware of what the kids are experiencing to make sure that uh, the, um, the pieces are in place uh, to build up students' resilience, which and one very important um, uh, ingredient in developing resilience in kids is that there are strong student-adult relationships even if it's not directly with our social workers, and Katie in particular, if it's with some teachers. And, and Katie does is instrumental in making sure that a lot of those systems are in place. Um, I venture to guess that there are not many, not many kids in the high school um, who are in trouble in social and emotional ways whose names Katie doesn't have or doesn't work with directly. Um, our other social worker, um, Bill Cook, um, splits time between the middle school and high school and he, she, he does many of the same kinds of things that Katie does as well, uh, splitting his time, but his focus particularly is special education students. And so he will deal with special educations from our <coughs> life school students, our life skills students, our most di disabled um, and handicapped students, to, to our very, very strong academically um, students who might have some emotional issues, some emotional disabilities or learning disabilities or whatever it is. Uh, but, but he does also a very, very effective job. Um, he is, 
he is constantly in his, in his office with groups of kids or individual kids, counseling kids and helping kids and forms really great and important relationships for them. Then we have two organizations uh, that meet on, both of which meet every other week. Um, one is a less formal organization which we call a pupil services team. Um, and the pupil services team is comprised of um, the school's guidance counselors, social workers, the special ed department chair, both of the school administrators, and the school nurse. Um, and I think that's everybody on the pupil services team. And basically that's a meeting that we have every other week that is essentially a brainstorming meeting. People bring names to the table of kids that they understand either from report cards or progress reports or other avenues that students are in trouble um, or need some support or may need some support. And it really acts as a way to exchange information about students in a very <coughs> informal way uh, because very often there's no one person who necessarily has all the pieces of the puzzle who has the big picture. So the PST's purpose is to make sure that the, all, all of us um, who are in a position to try to support those needs of kids uh, have a much better and more complete understanding of, of what the kids' needs are. Um, but the PST acts to plan next steps, whether it's parent-teacher conferences, uh, setting up <coughs> meetings, meetings with parents, um, arranging academic tutoring by National Honor Society students, adjusting student schedules, um, a whole host of things that the PST does. Um, the other team that's in place, which has become increasingly formal, uh, is, is the CAPE assistance team, the CAT. Each of the schools has a comparable organization. We each call it a little bit something different, but they all serve essentially the same roles. Um, and the membership of the CAT is the same as the PST, um, but it's also supplemented by one or two regular education teachers as well, uh, who very often know a lot of kids um, and have the classroom perspective on kids. Um, that organization meets every other week as well, um, and it does have a much more formal process of sort of identifying students who are in particular need of more formalized plans, but outside of the special education context. Um, and there is a more formal process of bringing names to the table, having the committee as a group discuss what we know about the particular student and then make a decision about whether we need to do a, engage in a more formal and structured data gathering by going out, talking to the student, talking to the student's parents, talking to the student's teachers, looking at the student's guidance file um, to see if there's anything there, um, and then coming around the table again the next, at the next meeting to, to consider the possibility of putting in place a more formal plan uh, that, again, is outside of special education, but in many cases operates to put in place some of the same kinds of accommodations that are available for special education students ranging from extended time on tests to reduced workloads to adapted schedules, um, a whole bunch of different things. And at any one time, I think we probably have 20 to 25 students who are on plans through the CAPE assistance team. Um, and and they, these students are also appointed a case manager, um, somebody who will act, act as, the, uh, as, as sort of the spokesperson for the parents and for the students um, to provide some targeted assistance. And this, these teams, I think, I think, as Claire has mentioned in the past and to the school board, um, uh, will become increasingly important, uh, particularly as Congress has just recently changed the special ed law um, to provide a model of, of referrals to special education and, and structure to considering special education referrals that depends on having teams like this in place. Um, so that is the work of the Keep Assistance Team, and I deliberately didn't pass out to you earlier, uh, but I'll pass out to you now, and you can take a look at it if you want, sort of the, uh, the documentation that we have in place that sort of describes the processes and the adaptations and things like that that the Keep Assistance Team provides on a regular basis. And if, as I'm distributing these, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me any questions. Questions for Jeff? I, I had a couple. First, Jeff, I just want to say I found that really interesting. I appreciate you putting that overview together. I think that's really helpful for us to have that perspective. Um, and then I just had a couple questions about the peer helpers. I was how many peer helpers are there? And 22. 22. And are they are they freshmen through seniors, or are they the older uh, freshmen? And do they act, do the peer helpers actually talk with kids who are needing some sort of help or wanting to talk, or is it more of a referral kind of system? It's, it's, it's both. It's both and, uh, really. Um, 
and they're, they're, they're part of their training is, is to, to be able to sort of recognize how to make a judgment about when they can provide some things and what they can't provide, and when they should refer things to Katie or Andrea or another adult in the building. So, but it really is both and. And are, and are there conversations always, um, you know, not tracked? I mean, I, not the substance of them, I mean, but every conversation that is held, I mean, does that go to Katie, Lisa? Does she know? Or is it only when it sort of goes into the realm of this needs to go to the, to the social workers? Um, I believe the answer I'm about to give is correct about this. The, the natural helpers meet also every other week or, every other, or once a month. I can't remember. And part of that meeting is sort of going over um, conversations that have come up in the role of the natural helpers and that sort of thing, so that Katie and Andrea have a sense of what's going on, even if there hasn't been a formal referral yet. And then I also just have a short comment about, I, I attended that meeting last week for the freshmen and sophomore parents um, that the guidance counselors put on, and I thought it was great. It was really informative. I really appreciate them doing it. I know a lot of other parents did too, so I feel like I saw firsthand the immediate impact of having an additional guidance counselor. So good. that's good work. Great. Can you help um, delineate um, for me again the difference between the CAPE assistance team and the pupil services team? Yeah, they're really, it's, it's just a big... The CAPE assistance team, the purpose of it, of it is to come up with formal plans for kids who are most in need, Rebecca. Um, and those are written plans that are voted on by the group after we look at all the data and that sort of thing. Um, it's the CAPE assistance team that op operates as the pre-referral uh, mechanism through to special education or 504 or those sorts of things. Um, the purpose of the PS the PST is able because it operates much less formally to, um, the purpose of the PST is not to create a formal plan. Um, it is to simply brainstorm issues, looking for short-term solutions, um, and, and because it operates less formally, it can it can get cover a whole lot more ground um, in individual things. <coughs> and sometimes what happens is that the PST, we come to the decision that, that that a particular student's issues merit more attention, and we'll actually refer things to the CAT. Jeff, I appreciate your kind remarks about the kindergarten. They, the kindergarten was moved down there years ago because of space needs, and uh, I guess the experiment worked out very well, according to you, and according to the kids that were down there. So it's nice remarks. Well, and uh, I think everybody in the high school would agree as well. Anyone else? Questions? Uh, Jeff, thanks for, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I don't know if you can really answer this, but I'm just curious. Um, do you have a sense of maybe what some of the leading issues are that Katie and the natural helper seem to be talking about or looking at? Um, <clears throat> I, I would say that depression is the number one issue that sort of affects, affects kids, particularly at, at high school age. And sometimes those are very situational de depressions, depending on what's happening with the kid at a given moment in time. And sometimes they're longer lasting. Uh, there are lots of other things as well, but I would say that's probably the, the number one thing. Interesting. Thank you. Jeff, thanks very much. You're welcome. Thank we you. We appreciate it. Going to move on to Gary. Lenoy with the technology report. <coughs> I guess my shirt's not going to work as a screen. Excuse me. challenge is to be close to the microphone and still be able to reach the computer. Yeah. So. 
Um, I was looking through some of my files and uh, found this technology report the school board presented on December 13, 1994, which is one of the first ones I gave back when I was a teacher in the classroom. Um, so I think this is my 10th tenth, tenth report, annual update, as far as you know, what's happening with technology in the Cape Elizabeth schools. Um, and this is intended to give you kind of a brief overview of some of, uh, some of the highlights of things that are happening. And I want to focus really on our, our technology plan, which you know, is all about the technology in the Cape Elizabeth schools and the laptops. Those are kind of big issues and big things that we've been working on um, over the past several years. Um, technology plan. It's become a little more formal than some of these, these ones that we did back in 1994. Uh, the state requires one. It is required for our federal E-rate funding. Uh, we can update it as necessary, but we have to have one submitted and has to be on file with DOE at least every three years. Um, we were at a point when we were deciding whether we were going to go you know, one to one at the high school level or kind of following our traditional laptop plan, our, our traditional technology plans and didn't really know where to go until we had a laptop committee that kind of put together and, and really gave us some direction that that's where we would like to be going. So the, the laptop, the technology plan was put together with a one-to-one -one focus that we wanted to kind of phase things in over several years. Now a plan is a plan that gives us direction, it gives us kind of a roadmap. Um, not all the things in the plan happen, but that's kind of where we would like to go. And, and that's um, where we are with with our current one. What started this whole thing was the, the MILTI program, the Main Learning Technology Initiative, which provided laptops to all 7th and 8th grade students um, at the middle school. It, I think it's been very successful at our middle school. We're currently in the third year of the program. We got, three years ago, we got a set of laptops for the then 7th graders. The next year after that, we got another set of laptops, which went again to the 7th graders, because the 7th graders took this forward. Uh, one of the things that you should know about that, it, it is a middle school program, so in all the discussions about high school laptops and things like that, some, some were suggested, well, couldn't we move things forward? But that is a state-sponsored program, and it is specifically designed for the middle school, so those do need to stay there. In fact, those laptops belong to the state. It really came apparent to me this year, because our enrollment at the middle school dropped by 20 or so students, so I had to have 20 laptops move to another school district. Some went to Westbrook, some went to Scarborough, because they don't belong to us. They belong to the state, and as our enrollment decreases, we just shuffle them and move them. But that's what that whole program was about. We had students that were involved with that for a couple of years as 7th and 8th graders, and we really wanted to try to see if we could do something to continue the program on at, at the high school. Um, as I was preparing budgets last year, we we were thinking that the state was going to, or indications were that the state was going to do something, you know, maybe fund the whole thing, maybe uh, do a piece of it. And I built my budget with one half the cost, thinking that we'd get some other funding from the state, or we'd get that other piece from the state. That didn't happen. Um, there was, a, a, there is a state-sponsored laptop program that I'll talk about here in a minute that that some schools took advantage of, but. It really didn't get formalized. The plan that was put together was kind of put together towards the end of June at a superintendent's conference where a bunch of school districts then decided that they would, they would sign up. We really couldn't move forward without the, the generous donation of the, the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation. They, they're a group that looks for projects like this and wanted to you know, give us kind of seed money to get started, and that's what happened that first year. They don't want to be the group that would you know, fund it annually in the budget, but they do want to provide opportunities for the district to do things like the one-to-one. -one. So this, between the, the CEIF grant and the budget, we were able to provide laptops to all of our freshmen and one half of the high school staff. That is problematic because high school classes, many of them are mixed. We get freshmen and with, with upperclassmen. Um, and it's problematic for me when I have to give half the staff laptops and, and not, not the other half. But you know, budgets are, are real, and we have to live within in those budgets, and that's what we could do. In a perfect world, we would have you know, tried to do things differently. 
once we knew that it was in the budget, we had the other funding from the, the Education Foundation, there was a whole bunch of work that needed to happen. Uh, we needed to install a wireless network at our high school. That was done as part of the Milty Project in the middle school, but that was kind of our responsibility. We needed some electrical stuff done in, in many of the rooms. We had spent a lot of time developing guidelines and procedures that I think are working fairly well at the middle school. And we took those and we took a look at them real closely with some of our students and staff and tried to figure out okay, what should we carry forward to the high school. And we developed <coughs> guidelines and procedures for the high school. Um, recruited a lead teacher, offered some summer staff development, and it finally got to the point where we could actually uh, distribute laptops. They arrived, we got them all imaged and cloned. We, we were able to get staff laptops early in September, and I believe we got the fresh laptops out late in September, right, right at the very end. How are laptops being used? Here are some of the things that are happening with them. Um, Jeff Shedd did a nice article in The View uh, about laptop use at the high school. Some of this came from there. Um, but they, they do these kinds of things and more with the, the laptops. Research presentations. I believe it was either last school board meeting and the one before Michael Lefton came with some students and demonstrated a, a software piece um, with the science that was done on the laptops. So those are the kinds of things that are happening. Those are the kinds of things that are happening at our uh, primary school as well. Here are some statistics that I was able to figure out or, or get from the state. There were 31 other high schools that opted into the, uh, a high school laptop program and the program had to be one-to-one -one in order for them to, to opt in. So 31 other high schools were doing that and there were five other districts like us because everything was kind of late June, we had already decided to move forward. We went into a contract with Apple ahead of time and we actually got, I think, a little bit better deal um, than the state. So basically there were 36 high schools out of 140 in the state of Maine that uh, went with a one-to-one -one program. That's around 25 percent. I'm sorry, Gary, right. can you explain to me what a one-to-one -one program is? One-to-one -one means that in the, in the middle school, what happens with the one-to-one with the -one -one program with the laptops is students get issued a laptop at the beginning of the year just like a textbook. It's theirs. Um, they carry it with them all the time. They, it, they can take it home if they have, if they've, you know, parents have attended meetings and we have permissions. So it's theirs to use all, all year long. And that's, that's the one-to-one. -one. Instead of having, going to a lab and picking a computer that's, oh. that's open and available or having a mobile lab where I grab the first one on the shelf that's free, this is, this is mine. And students do think of their laptops as theirs, even though they're not, even though they're not even Cape Elizabeth at the middle school. But they do think of them as, as theirs. But one-to-one -one means 100% access for them. Gary, um, of those 31 high schools, did anyone do it 9 through 12, or did most of them do just ninth grade? I believe they all did it just like we did, phased in, unless there's, there's a very, very small high school really? in, that, okay. in that group. Just curious. Uh, but most of them started like we did. Mm -hmm. you know, and again, in a perfect world, we would have tried to do the whole high school, but that, yeah. that was tough to do. Um, we had that same kind of issue with the middle school. We have some mixed seventh and eighth grade classes, and the first year we had just seventh grade kids with laptops. And, and it kind of all works itself out after a while. Um, many people have said, why not do mobile labs instead of one-to-one? -one? Mobile labs and parks, we have laptops in them, and you can roll them in the classroom and be used uh, by a particular class. Well, the ownership issue that I talk about with one-to-one, -one, where the, the kids really think that these, this is my laptop, I'm going to take care of it, I'm going to make sure it's charged, I'm going to make sure that it's, it's working for me, because i got all my stuff on there, all my classwork and things like that. That ownership happens. It doesn't happen in a mobile lab. In the mobile lab, you know, I'll take one off the shelf. If it isn't working right, I can just slide it back on the shelf and grab the one underneath it. Uh, I may not even plug it in so that it's charged for the next person that uses that. Those kinds of things happen. There's a lot of little logistical issues about, you know, for a mobile lab, a teacher's going to have to sign up for it. It's going to have to get to their classroom. They're going to have to maybe plug in a few things. So there's some logistical things that they have to do before they can use it with their class. When kids come with laptops, you basically, instead of opening your book, you open your laptops and you can do what you need to do. Um, the immediate access with mobile apps, you've got to sign up. With the one-to-one, -one, it's there all the time. 
and the work stored on the laptops, kids carry their work with them. This, this has got all my stuff on it, so I know where it is and I can get to it very easily. And, and that's what happens with our, with our kids in our classes too. So all those projects I'm working on for science and social studies, all the English papers, they're all right here. And if I've done my backup properly, even if something happens to this, I'll, I'll have those. Um, read this book over the summer, Never Mind the Laptops, uh, Kids, Computers, and the Transformation of Learning. We may think that you know, the laptop piece is a new idea. That book is about a, the laptop program that was in Australia. It started in the, the mid-1990s. Um, and what they found over time is that um, the constant presence of the laptops in the classroom basically makes them disappear. It's, it's not about the technology, it's not about the computer, it's just another tool that they use for all of their other work. So they're, they're there, but the focus isn't on those. There's a lot of other good, positive things that came out of their suggestions about how to make the one-to-one -one, uh, strategies for it to work. Former Governor King's vision was that it really wasn't about the technology, it's about teaching and learning. Students are, the, the term, digital natives. They, they've grown up with that. It's a second nature to them. And our, some of our teachers are immigrants. And <laughs> we need to do the, the staff development to get them you know, to the stage where they're, they're comfortable with it. And teachers also are now becoming comfortable with asking those natives to help them sometimes. So students <coughs> help them with, with some of the things that, that they're working on. Successful one-to-one -one strategies. A leadership team, the team at the middle school where we have a principal, we have a tech person, and we have a, a, a lead teacher. And we have that same piece working at, at the high school. So we kind of have a core group that's kind of leading the challenge. That is critical, and that's what they found has been critical in, in Australia. Have, have the leadership to make this thing successful. The support's got to be there. If things break down, we've got to have a, a, you know, means and methods to get things fixed. We have the teachers on board, and we have to provide all kinds of professional development for them. You'll find that our strongest group of teachers with the integration of technology are probably our seventh grade teachers. Why? Because they've had the laptops the longest. They've had them for three years. They've had the staff development, the training. Um, they're used constantly. We're not quite there in, you know, at the high school yet, but it's our first year at the high school. And as we provide more and more of the support, that will grow. Sure. Uh, no. Um, one that the leadership teams work. Is there sharing and communication among the seventh graders and the high school teams as they're starting? I mean, I know there's content areas that they're teaching are different, but are the seventh grader teachers able to communicate and share what their experiences are with the high school? Teams? We've we've done that. In fact, we did one of the faculty meetings. The high school invited teachers up, and we had some seventh and eighth grade teachers there, and just to you know, here's. Here's what things have worked for us at the middle school, and that kind of sharing is happening, yes. What does the future hold? Eh, many unanswered questions. Um, and I've tried to get some of these answers from the state, and it's, it's difficult because the state <laughs> doesn't know the answer to some of these right now. What's going to happen? The middle school program, the MILTI program, is a four-year program. We're in the third year of it. Next year is the last year. What happens with that? Where is, you know, Will it be state support to continue that at the middle school level? We don't know. We, we're thinking there will be. Um, they're telling me it might be part of the essential programs and services funding model, um, but we're not even sure what, what all of that means. Continuation of laptops at the high school. We, we would really like to go there. I talked to several of the schools in the local area that have, have the one-to-one -one already. Everybody wants to go there. Everyone's kind of initially put it in a budget, but as you know, this is the beginning stages of the budget. What's there in May or June, we don't know, but everyone wants to go that way, or most of them all want to go that way. I haven't polled everyone, but that seems to be the trend. Um, the other piece is that the new funding model, Essential Programs and Services, has three areas that are dedicated. I believe it's special services, local assessment, and technology, and you're, you have dedicated funds that are supposed to go. You, sh you should be spending this kind of money in those areas. What that all means, I'm not sure. We're not even sure what that figure is. But it could potentially might be a funding for our laptops at the high school. 
So that's, that's where we are. Unfortunately, there's more unanswered questions and, and answered questions, but uh, we're moving forward and we're trying to get the answers. Question, when the eighth, the eighth graders turn the laptops in, how long does it take you to <coughs> clear them out for the incoming seventh grade? That's, that's our summer work. So they're ready, they're pretty much ready to go the first of September when they come back. So, and we do that. Do you find any that are malfunctioning? I mean, do you have spares? I mean, you said you had to give some to Westbrook or some other place. We do have some spares, but the state does not give you a liberal amount of spares. Um, and we're finding three-year-old laptops that have been in the hands of students are, you know, they're, things are giving out. Yep. Um, Absolutely. I, I think we've got maybe a dozen or so laptops out right now, and I don't have a dozen spares to, to, yeah. to give out. We try to give out spares to the, the critical need ones and, and try to help other ways. Um, if they're backing up their files, they could go to the library, they could go to the lab to get continue working. So we do have technology elsewhere, but... Other questions? I, I just <clears throat> I wanted to make a comment about um, how you were able to bring, or the district leadership team was able to bring the laptops to the high school um, to let people know that, as I understand it, our, even though we did, paid 27000 and the Education Foundation made a, a contribution also, um, you were able to do that by prioritizing within your budget um, without increasing your technology budget by 27000 um, We made choices, or Gary made choices, um, that we did not replace a particular computer lab at one of the schools um, in order to do that and committed to moving the laptops forward. So um, I know we said thank you back then, but I, I, I want to just make sure that everyone realizes that um, that's how we do things when we try to get new programs. We very often have to eliminate something else. So, um. And as, if we move forward, as we continue forward with, with one to one, you know, we need to take a look. Do we need the computer labs? Do we need all the computers in the libraries and things like that if, if everyone has one to one access? So we need to be able to take a look at our existing stuff and see if there is some, some cost savings that would help with, help support the one-to-one -one program. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you thought, I'm sorry. <laughs> Wondered why that blue light was <laughs> For those who don't know, the next item on the agenda is a report from the Pond Cove teachers. Um, so I welcome them and would ask Tom if you'd introduce the faculty for the folks watching at home. And Gary, thanks very much. That was a great report. Really, to respond to your request that we have something come out of the building, Kelly Hassan, the teacher leader, is here tonight to give you an update on the uh, work we've been doing to change the uh, connection of writing from um, kindergarten to fourth grade. So Kelly's speaking for the whole staff, I believe, and this is her PowerPoint presentation. Good evening. Um, before I start, I, I want to say, yes, we're sorry for your loss. The, the kindergarten, but I have to say, all of us at Pond Cove are <laughs> thrilled to have you back. So we're, we're very happy. Thank you so much for this opportunity for, to allow me to share with you um, an overview of our kindergarten through fourth grade writing curriculum that's new at Pond Cove this year. My intent this evening is to give you 
important information on essential components and concepts that connect to the, the good work that we're doing in writing instruction. I am going to give you some information to start with. I've saved the best for last, so there are some visual images of all students working and some examples of student work. So I, I think you'll find it both informative and entertaining as well. But before I begin, I, I can't express enough as far as the incredible commitment and um, delivery of instruction that the teachers have given to this program thus far. It can't be overstated. And they have done just an amazing job of instilling within their students an intrinsic desire to write and to really view themselves as authentic authors. So as I take you through this, please keep that in mind because it's just integral to the whole program. The rationale behind the um, selecting a new writing program for kindergarten through grade four really stems from external and internal indicators. Internally, we saw the need for instructional improvement, consistency, and alignment across all grade levels. And correlating with that was the need to have common language, routines, and curriculum expectations so that all students going, you know, going from grade to grade would have this these, these commonalities, and particularly when you think of children who receive support services, whether it's through special ed, um, special education, or instructional support um, outside of special education, it's really critical um, to have those pieces aligned. Externally, we certainly have a new change this year with the initial implementation of the main learning results when we, when we look at the amount of certification assessments that require competency in written responses, we've found that it's critical that they be able to compose their answers well. Some of them are, are short response, some of them are longer response responses, but it's very, it, it, it's very important that we give them the appropriate instruction to be able to meet those needs. Writing scores on the fourth grade, ma main educational assessments, the MEAs, have, have been comparatively weak all along, not just within Cape Elizabeth, but across the state, um, compared to scores in Reagan math. And we would, like to, we would like to target that and address and see, look at that as an external indicator that, that you know, looks at, are we, not, are, are we providing appropriate instruction? And if not, what can we do? Last, so last spring, everyone at Pond Cove committed to aligning the writing curriculum, and we took took some time looking at research-based resources, attending conferences, and really trying to come up with the appropriate resources that we needed for our instruction. So the teaching resources that were selected for kindergarten through grade two, units of study for primary writing, this is a nine-volume set. Lucy Calkins is the author. She and her colleagues at Columbia University Teachers College in New York <coughs> developed this. Lucy. Hawkins is, I say Lucy, like she's my friend, but um, <laughs> she seems like it. Um, she has, is just out, esteemed in the profession. I, I can't say enough about her work, and for over 20 years she's been doing research and working in classrooms. These three books show you the first three units in the kindergarten through grade two continuum, and those have already been completed, and I will explain a little bit more about where we are um, in, in the progression of that. It's a nine-volume set, and um, we're, we're finding them to be very user-friendly. Te teachers are really, really finding them to be very effective in their instruction. Uh, the resources for grades three and four, they're combining two, and it's working very well. On the left, you're going to see teaching the Qualities of Writing and by Joanne Portalupi and Ralph Fletcher. Again, they are esteemed gurus in the field of writing instruction. We've used their work before. We've been very satisfied. They came out with this work uh, last year. If you look behind that book, you're going to see three cards. It, the, the book comes with a whole set of cards that are very user-friendly. It's not a one-size-fits-all program, and they, you know, they, they make that clear but it gives teachers a nice structure for how to weave through different qualities of writing. And you'll see later in the presentation what these qualities are and what, what they involve. On the right is the No-Nonsense Guide to Teaching Writing. And Judy Davis and Sharon Hill, they're educators from the Manhattan New School. 
which is a, a very progressive public school in New York City, a lot of work that we use over the years has stemmed from that school. And what's nice is it's empirically based. That these people also work closely with Columbia Teachers College Reading and Writing Project, which is where Lucy Calkins, um, which, which she leads. So it all ties in really well together. So we're finding that it's, it's a nice natural fit. <coughs> Professional development began last summer. And the kindergarten, the kindergarten through grade four teachers, literacy specialists, and myself collaborate for two days in August. Uh, special education teachers were intending to come. They had a conflict of another workshop. So they also have gotten on board. I didn't want this to be misleading for you to think that they hadn't, they're not also involved in this. And this is, these are these different um, components here just show you an overview of what the discussions, planning, decisions, and all the preparation included. And we first targeted the impact analysis. What was the impact? What was this going to mean for teachers and students, the writing content and instruction itself, so that we could pace it well and not get in too far over our heads and make sure that we made some strategic decisions in, in a way that was thoughtful and not going in too far or making too many, too many decisions at once. Certainly curriculum considerations and the instructional frameworks, making decisions on the duration, how frequently we were going to be teaching writing, and the structure of the workshop, which you will see later in this, in this uh, presentation, teaching strategies. And that's where those resources came in. And we really looked at what was important at different levels of instruction and what needed to be done. Assessment measures, you'll, you'll be enlightened in that, you know, with that area later in the presentation. The resources needed, as we went through, we saw there were student materials and instruction, instructional, instructional tools needed. The good news is they're not expensive. There's not, there's not consumable workbooks. And so on a, on a budget uh, basis, that, that's good news for you. Uh, the units of study calendar was established. And that's being flexible, because being the first year, we really didn't know what, as far as duration, we went by the recommendations of the teaching resources by the experts. But we've, teachers have been flexible um, in knowing when their students needed to move on or when their students need some extra time within a certain unit. And then we came up with a, an implementation plan. And now I'm going to take you through the structure of the kindergarten through grade four writing program. This is um, a first grade in the middle of their writer's workshop. This is uh, first grade teacher Julie Mullen. And for grades one through four, the writer's workshop takes place daily. And it extends from 45 minutes to an hour. And um, you know, depending on what the schedule of the day is. But that's basically what it, what it entails. Kindergarten's writer's workshop, that is approximately three times per week. And that is 30 minutes, being a half-day program. You'll notice on the left, there's a tongue sticking out. So we know we have someone fully engaged and very purposeful right there. I see a lot of tongues sticking out there. Um, a very important component of the writer's workshop, it opens up with mini lessons. And so this third grade teacher, Holly Forsyth, is giving a mini lesson. And it's hard to see on the right, but it's, she actually has a chart there where the students work together on planning a plot of a story. So it's the beginning, turning point, ending. So it's very specific teaching points on strategies and skills. And what is usually expected, the students then are asked to try to try out these new things that they've learned within the mini lesson. And at the end of the, end of the writer's workshop, when there's a sharing time, the teacher often will say, who tried out putting in a turning point in their story this time. You know, who would like to share that? So it all ties in, you know, in a, as a cycle. And then there, the mini lesson follows with active student engagement. And that's when the students are writing and the teacher is going around and conferencing with individual students, which you'll see. Here's fourth grade teacher Ingrid Stressinger, and she's conferencing with a student. The conferences are one-on-one. -on -one depending on what the focus is, depending on what the student needs are. Typically, a teacher 
will go around, do a status of the class to check in with everybody what they're working on, what they need to go, what they need to be focusing on for the day, answering any questions. And then he or she works with approximately six students within that time frame on really um, giving them an intense one-on-one -on -one, um, conference. And, and it's, it's been very effective. Student partnerships, that, this is an exciting component because it allows the students then to take ownership of helping one another. And you'll see a little bit of this. This is a second grade class. And this particular photo is they're, they're doing some peer editing. So they're helping one another make changes in their writing, making some suggestions on what they could do. This is an after the workshop sharing. This is kindergarten. And this is Linda Paul. They're sitting in a circle, and they've got their writing pieces that they've done for the day. And the after the workshop sharing, sometimes it might focus on a specific teaching point that was delivered in the mini lesson that, again, like I, I mentioned earlier, they, they want to revisit and say, does anyone want to share? Like in kindergarten, it might be who today's lesson was about leaving spaces between words. Is there anyone that would like to show us how they did that today? And of course, they all want to show you. So um, you know, it, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty exciting. It just really honors and highlights the good work that was done that day. Mentor texts, um, they, these are books that are powerful models for students on how you can craft certain elements in writing. Like on the left, the, those books are for kindergarten through grade two. And on the right, they're grades three and four. And say a, say a second grade is learning about how to craft an effective lead, a teacher will take one of those books. And they're always books that the, the teacher has always read them ahead of time. So the students are very familiar with the content of the book. But she's just, he, he or she, I say she because there's only, only women in second grade. Um, She's going to look at just focusing the lead and even talking about like the kissing hand is by Audrey Penn. She's, she's going to talk as if Audrey's like their friend. What did you notice Audrey did? Um, what, did you, what did you think about the lead? And then the students will come up with what things that they found were, well, gee, when, 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 they op when she opened with dialogue or when, when the character was talking, that really made me want to read it more, I mean, things like that. And then in turn, the students then go and, and try to apply that in their own writing. And it's very powerful. And we're seeing a wonderful interrelationship with reading and writing. We're seeing students coming up to their teachers and saying, listen to this lead. Look at this. Look at the details in this. And this was, you know, that this is just a nice nice side effect of, um, of what effective writing instruction can bring forth. Writing tools, there's a variety, and I can't, even, I can't list them all, but this is, um, this is a first grade classroom. You're going to see in the background, it's a word wall. This was earlier in the year, and um, these are obviously words that students can go up. They're, they're high frequency words. They go up and they use them as they see needed. And they're words that we want the students to be able to use in their everyday writing. So the teachers work hard at developing a high frequency word list for them. On the left are writing folders. In, in second grade, they use two pocket folders. And you know it goes on up through the grade so that there's novelty, yet there's also a progression of um, how the tools are used. On the right, the writing tool bin in, in this particular class includes like a date stamp. Students don't have to stop and laboriously write out the date every time that they're doing something, but it's important to record for our record keeping. So they're, they're stamping the date. They have fix-it tape in there. They have highlighters that they're using along in lessons. They use markers that they're using for their show, to show their editing and revising. So there's a lot. And the children really respond well to these tools. That's a, another form of engagement that they're really responding well to. They really like, like it. And depending on the unit, <coughs> new tools are introduced through each unit so that there's something novel, there's some, something new that they can, they can try out as they're, as they're progressing through the, through the curriculum. And this is... Um, I, I won't mess with it. <laughs> Try to make it clear. This end of the unit celebrations occur 
as each unit culminates. And this is a first grade class. This is teacher Karen Dow. And what, they, what the students do is they share what they think is their most important work. At the end of each unit, in kindergarten through grade two, they do something called fixing and fancying up. And in third and fourth grade, it's, it's, it's right down to revising and, and making it their final, final edition. But um, as we progress through the months and the units, the end of the unit celebrations become more sophisticated. Right now, most of them are, they're, right at this point, they're inviting another class in to read to each other. They might invite a special guest from the school to come in. Um, parents will be invited as it progresses and, and grows more in sophistication. But it's, it's just a nice way to really honor the efforts and achievements of all the students. The grade two, th the kindergarten through grade two units of study Typically, they go from four to six weeks, culminate with publishing, which just means a final, final classroom edition that they've worked hard at fixing up. I'm not going to talk to you about each sing, every single um, unit, but I'll focus more on where they are currently. It starts out, obviously, with launching the writer's workshop, where routines are established. Um, kindergarten supplements with a labeling unit to help them connect meaning um, with things that are in their environment. Small moment personal narrative, narratives are when helping students zoom right in on something. Not we, we used to call them bed to bed stories when it was in those of you that <laughs> had children that have written bed to bed stories, you know that they, they wake up and it tells you about every single part of their day until they go to bed. So we're, we're moving away from that, letting them zoom in. Writing for readers, this part is for kindergarten through grade two is really the beginning part of editing, really helping them know in order for other people to read your stories, these are the kinds of things that good writers do. And it can start out is by just making sure spaces are between words right up to punctuation and capitalization and checking for spelling, all those things. And there are just wonderful lessons that the teachers have been doing to help them with that. Right now, grades one and two are finishing on the craft of revision. Kindergarten is, is between small moments and writing for readers. They're kind of combining it because it's kind of needed for both. Craft of revision now focuses on the content. What is it that you can do to make your story more interesting? What details can you add in there that um, really do more what we call showing writing versus telling writing? You might say, this is my friend. He is nice. Well, give us some details. What is it that's so nice about your friend? And things like that that really help them focus in and, and as we often say, close your eyes and make a movie behind your eyelids. The next one is authors as mentors, which targets specific authors that students will use as models through the grades. Nonfiction, this is for grades one and two only because of kindergarten's half day for this year. They're only going to do five units, and uh, we're going to see how that goes. Nonfiction, this part here really starts to lay the foundation for future research. And research, so this lets them see how they can take things that they are most interested in, make them, make them interesting, but then also pull in interesting facts that are, that are real. So um, that's an important one that connects, you'll see, to third and fourth grade. Grade two, this year only, is doing poetry, and that's really working on more la expressive language pieces where students can experiment with how they can, I'm going to say, add a little music to their, to their writing. So it's, it's pretty powerful. Grades three and four actually have less units of study because they actually ex extend a little bit longer. They're, they also have a launching the writing workshop, which establishes their routines. Personal narrative is similar to the small moments unit in kindergarten through grade two, but it pulls it out and stretches it even more so. Uh, right now, this is interesting, right now, grades three and four are working here. Originally, they were both going to do feature articles. Grade three has seen a lot of success with tying in nonfiction with their current science unit of the human body. And you'll see some really, really amazing writing from third graders and how they're doing that. And one third grade teacher, Cameron Rosenblum, said, well, how about 
nonfiction with flair, because that's what you're going to see, is they're really, they now, what they have previously learned, they're now incorporating that into the nonfiction unit. And the feature articles for grade four, they're doing an amazing job on this. They're, the teachers first immerse them with showing them all kinds of feature articles that are related to things that they're most interested in. And they use resources like Time for Kids and Scholastic News. Students are encouraged to bring things in from home that they find to be really interesting. And they learn things about um, how, you, how you incorporate graphics, how you use subheadings, um, and also things like point of view, that most feature articles have some, someone's writing about it for a reason. And what you can do if you're passionate about something and how your point of view can be conveyed. They also have a poetry unit that follows this, both, both grades. And then this summer they decided, this being the first year, they really weren't sure how students were going to respond to certain things. And even though it's a spiral program, they wanted to give, have enough flexibility so they weren't packing in too much too soon. So there's an open cycle. And that really is determined by the teachers depending on their student needs and interests. So they may go back and revisit some of these, these other units if they feel students need more work in them. At the same time, they may expand on something that the students seem to want to wanna go forward and, and explore more, say, say biographies or fiction. Now the four qualities of writing, this stems from the qualities of writing book. And the ideas section, all of them are incorporated throughout all the units. So it's not, it's not like we're only going to work on ideas in this unit. They're incorporated in all the units. Ideas include the, the different concepts of uh, topics, details, characters, setting, all of the things where students really need to think about what's the, what's the basis of their story going to be. Point of view falls under there. Design is the next quality. And that one is really that one really focuses on the organization of their writing. How, what is the focus, and what is the beginning like? What is the ending like? Those are design features. The language is a very important one, and you, and you will hear much of it um, coming up. This focuses on voice, on clarity, on sentence structure, things where the student really needs to get that emphasis in so that that story has some flair, really gives, you know, really sends a message of what that writer's trying to convey. The last one is presentation. This is when it all comes together. There's something that the authors call cool tools, that students are learning how to use ellipses, how to use colons and semicolons and parentheses. They actually started learning some of those, some of those conventions in the very first unit. Um, it pulls together the, all of the things that revising and editing do so that the final form is the ultimate presentation. All of these, as I said, cycle through all of the units. And the third and fourth grade teachers have made a commitment to make sure that they target all of these within every unit. And, they, and we, we keep very careful records of what has been targeted with each grade level. The assessment measures, the first and last pieces of student writing are collected from each unit of study so we can analyze those. Anecdotal records of daily student writing are taken. And weekly assessment forms are provided to document the strengths, where growth is needed, and where um, lessons can target areas of need. And then the end of the unit assessment forms these record the progress that students have made in writing and inform future instruction. And that ties back in the into the first one where the, we look at the first and last pieces of student writing to see, to see where that goes. There's also, I, um, teachers are u assessing the effectiveness of each unit. And we have un end of the unit evaluations that we've created. So, I've got a typo there. That, um, so teachers can see, well, this lesson went well, or this one didn't, and these are the recommendations that we would make for next time. Um, what, what mentor texts were effective, how students responded, what was the enjoyment uh, factor here. 
did the unit go too slow? Was it too, you know, did we need to extend it, you know, longer than was recommended? Okay, now is the good part. <laughs> These, I'm going to take you through all the grade levels, and you're going to see everyone in action. And there, there are some um, writing pieces as well. So here's kindergarten, and you can see very engaged. And this was actually a couple of months ago, so this was this was not a, this was not a recent shot. So you could see even as if it's as recent uh, as early as um, late fall, this is what they were doing. Here's Catherine Cornell, kindergarten teacher, conferencing with one of the children. This is a version of the end of the um, day's sharing. And these kindergarten students are actually doing what's called a museum walk. They have, the kindergarten teacher has laid out their, their work for the day, which on that day, you know, the, the page that they completed that day, and they're going around and they're acting, they're pretending they're in a museum, but they're looking at one another's pieces and making comments to one another. And this is Amy Kieran, who is working with a kindergartner, and she's helping her sound out words, a very important thing. I think it's a vowel that she is sounding out right there, <laughs> looking at her lips. And here's some example of kindergarten writing. And the one on the right shows you an example from the labeling unit. That's, um, anyone know what? Yeah, there's the teacher. Um, not sure, the, the likeness could be any of them, I'm sure. Um, and then on the left is, is a student that, you know, has, has made the sentence. And this is first grade, and this is typical of what you will see them doing. There are their tools in the middle of their group, and they are, they are working on their stories. Their writing folders are nearby. And this is a picture of a celebration, and a, this is the end of a launch celebration where two boys are reading a story together and the other students are listening. And this is a first grade where they are um, working together and reading one another's writing, and they're writing comments on post-its, uh, and comments that I, I have one with me, but the comments that they're writing are like, I liked your details, I liked your sounding out. Um, so they're, the teachers are learning, the teachers are helping them be very specific, not just, I liked your story, but they're really helping them see what are the pieces that, they're, that are most effective in their writing. And here's a, two boys sharing, and this is a part of the celebration piece where they're, this is two boys from two different classrooms. And here's a nice piece from first grade. I went to Thanksgiving at Aunt Joan's house, and I played with Stephen. And you probably can't see, up at the top, she's saying, she's got some dialogue in there, give me the hat. So there's, there's dialogue going on. This is one page from a, from a story she did. And this one, I can read, and we dressed up, this is the ending, and we dressed up and we did a dance and a play. It was so romantic. <laughs> <sighs> this is second grade. This is um, Sarah Carroll, second grade teacher. And, um, the day I was working in that classroom, they were doing peer editing. She's working with these, these two partners. And this was part of her mini lesson. These were, the, these were the phrases that the children were coming up with to help one another. And you can see they're respectful, but it really helps them to look for things and at the same time be, honor what their, what their classmates have done, but at the same time, take some ownership and try to move them along. And here's two partners doing just that. These are small moment stories where you can see my canoe adventure, when me and my family went to the beach, and this would be a, a final published version. Sometimes the published versions are typed, other times they're just written very neatly by the students. Um, so it doesn't, the publishing doesn't have to necessarily be typed. And this one, if I can get, this is a wonderful example. If I can read, I put my glasses on, and I'm not even sure I can still do it. If you look, there's some writing in pink, and that is a result of the latest unit that they're working on, the craft of revision. The student has a rough draft, and she's gone back to revise to make her story more effective. I was walking to Fort Williams. 
I crossed the street, and then she added, when the cars, when there were no cars. Now I was at the park near the, she added, white sledding hill. I ran across the sparkling white snow. It was hard to run in my coat and snow pants. And she added, if it was summer, I could have run twice as fast. <laughs> Just really, we call that an inner story, what she's thinking. And her second page is, I dragged a sled up the, and she had it in, a des description, steep snowy hill, it was red. My friend Livia was taking the toboggan up. I was excited. The sled was a little bit heavy. I could barely get up. And she added in, it was like dragging a truck up the hill. I finally got to the top. So really nice example of, of how she could add in the details. And here's third grade. This is um, teacher Cameron Rosenblum. She's doing a mini lesson at the overhead with, on teaching beginning paragraphing. And just so you know, all of the students have this same piece on their desk. And it's an interactive lesson. So as she is going through um, the pieces, she's already introduced this part here. So students are then looking at the piece. The, the, we call it, the, it could be a mentor text, or we call it an exemplar text. They're looking for where paragraph breaks can occur based on these concepts that they've just learned. And this, this picture was in the view, but this one shows John marking where his paragraphs go. And I don't know, it's hard to see right here, but you're gonna, you might notice also there's some other, he's using a, um, an orange marker to put where paragraphs should go in his rough draft. He also has some yellow highlighted words there. That is from a previous lesson on word choice. So he's, you can see that the same drafts can culminate with many different lessons um, to make it more powerful. So they, they take out and they're using the different colored highlighters so they know what pieces that they, they, they know which components of the lessons that they're, that they're um, responding to. This is, I think, really powerful. This is a chart showing how third grade teachers are integrating their science unit about the human body with writing. And this is actually from a teacher, uh, Janet Amberger's class. On the left, you're going to see five body parts. And what, this, what she did with the students is the students then brainstormed what some subheadings could be over on the right. And not only does it, you know, does it help them with their writing and organizing that, but it really helps the teachers see concept attainment. I mean, without the, these subheadings really reveal students' understanding of, of the science concepts that they're learning about. So it's really powerful. And here's Ren Wilkinson conferencing with an, a student who's working in his writer's notebook. And the writer's notebook is used by third and fourth graders. And it's really, it's not a rough draft. It's not the final. It's really for students to put in their seed ideas and try out the things that they've learned in their mini lessons. And then from the writer's notebook, they pull those pieces that they find are most important to them, and they start them start using rough drafts, uh, creating them that will then eventually lead to final drafts. This is <laughs> this is amazing. This is a third grader who has been experimenting with leads, but now she's weaving in her information about science. Did you ever get water up into your nose? Well, don't panic. Why you ask? It's a little thing I like to call the epiglottis. <laughs> and on the left, she has a sidebar. They're learning how to do sidebars in, in nonfiction. She, breathe in, breathe out. And this one is harder to, to read on the screen, but it's about when you swallow spaghetti and what happens to it as it goes down through your stomach. And she has something on the side, a sidebar fact that um, explains, she, she talks about the esophagus in her piece, but she... <laughs> She says on, on her sidebar a fact that the esophagus is an involuntary muscle. So when you swallow food, so food does not come up when you eat upside down. So if any of you are in, so inclined to eat upside down, fear not that the food will, you know, the food will not be coming up. And this shows a feature article put together on something that a student feels passionate about. And obviously, in this case, it's gymnastics. But notice the subheadings, how she's organized it, and 
the teacher noticed that the students were having a hard time focusing on subheadings and not making them into um, sentences. So he decided to give them big pieces of chart paper, and it really helped them with their organization and, and so that they could space out um, their, their different um, areas of how they were going to organize their piece. This is fourth grade. This is fourth grade teacher Sue Welch, who is going around doing a status of the class. And this is an assessment measure, and a very important one. So she's, walked, she's going around before she starts conferencing, and she's checking to see what's making sure what students are writing about, what they need to work on, <coughs> and who, who she should be conferencing with, or if she needs to build in an extra conference that she wasn't planning on. Um, so it's, it's very important part of the day this is, um, this is from Ingrid Stressinger's fourth grade. She was reading feature article examples, and the students were um, coming up with the different elements that authors were using. And over time, as, um, and the other fourth grade teachers were doing the same thing, that over time, as they read more and more feature articles, they were checking off the different elements that they noticed were in these articles. So it's really powerful as they start recognizing these features because then they're translating it into their own writing. And here's a student working in his writer's notebook. And keep in mind, this is seed ideas. He's writing down some ideas, and, and many of them are actually writing full stories. Of this. These writer's notebook seed ideas then lead to rough drafts, these girls are actually working on final drafts on, um, once, they, once they've gone to the rough draft. And, but I want to show you sort of a progression. These girls are do, writing in the writer's notebook. This is a rough draft stemming from an idea in the writer's notebook about Onyx the cat. And it's, it's difficult to see, but on the right, there's an editing checklist. And it's numbered one through eight. And it covers things like spelling, tricky words, does, does it make sense? Punctuation. And on the left, the rough draft is a little hard to see, but um, this student has actually written down one through eight. And this is, this is a strategy that the teachers are, have been teaching them. She's written down one through eight for each paragraph. And as she checks off, like spelling is number one over on the right. As she checks her spelling in that first paragraph, she crosses off number one. As she checks off tricky words, and the tricky words are like the different, the different forms of there, things like that. She's crossing off. So it's a really effective tool for helping them do their own editing. And this is her final draft of, of Onyx the Cat. So it's, it's very powerful. And then we had a first grader write a culmination, make a culmination for us. So that's our little presentation about our writing curriculum so far. But um, all of us are really thrilled so far, and we're, we're revising as we go along and making notes, but um, it's, it's very exciting, and we look forward to sharing more as the year goes on. So if you have any questions or anything that you saw that needs clarification. No, I just want to commend you, Tom and Kelly, for um, taking a look at the results of the MEA, seeing an area that needed addressing, and devising a very powerful program, it looks like. And I, I've been hearing from people that they've been there, the, the parents are very excited about it, and the kids are very excited about it. So, really excellent, excellent response, an excellent program. You guys should be proud. Thank you. We're, we're excited. Can I ask one question? Um, I think it's great, too. Um, and I would echo Rebecca's comments. I'm just curious to know, we've done well in so we've done well um, in our math. Typically, we have a K to 12, the looping math. And I'm just curious to know, does this loop continually throughout the rest of the school district, like the middle school, or is it solely a K to 4 type program? We've had actually Nancy. Nancy came over one day because um, we've had discussions about having third and fourth grade teachers talking with fifth grade teachers. So the interest is there and feedback from the school school teachers has been the same. So I think, you know, ultimately it would be, it would be a wonderful, um, and then, you know, the, the, the math is a good model for that and how the spirals work. So um, I, that. I, I would just add, I think, too, because um, high school and uh, middle school and New York teachers got really involved in the six traits writing. And one of the things when Kelly and I were talking, although we deal with six traits, 
I said, oh, I bet this is how they fit into the four, and it was very close. So it's a, yeah. it will be yeah, an expansion of that, but I think if we have that conversation, we can help students make that transition from one type of language to another. And Lucy Hawkins is a writer that also writes for middle school writers as well, too. So um, her work travels across the grade levels. And I, I, we need to have some conversations, but the interest is there to see that. And she admits, I mean, as do Joanne for Lucy and Ralph Fletcher, that they, they, are on, they stand on the shoulders of giants. So it's not like they, there's, there's many writing gurus that have preceded them that they're building upon. So it's, it's, as Nancy said, it, it ties in. You know, the thread is certainly something that I think you know, it's, it's possible that you know, it, it will be. Thank you. Kelly. I have a, a, a question, just a little background. Um, when you <coughs> developed this program with the teachers and Tom, where, did, where do you get all this information and, and what type of places do you access? A lot of it, like actually the Lucy Coggins, the Lucy Coggins set um, came, our awareness of it was when we attended the Northeast Literacy Conference, um, which typically has been for the last several years in Providence, Rhode Island. That was previous fall and there's one a publisher that we use a lot we use a lot um, Heinemann and I remember I think Karen Abbott first grade teacher extraordinaire here may have been with me but we were like leaping over this crowd when we saw this set we said could this be the answer so these kinds of conferences what's nice is it it gives us exposure we hear the speakers we hear what their newest work is or we hear you know how they what they've published but we also get a chance to look at the materials because you can order materials sometimes they send you samples sometimes they don't but we also read a lot of literature on what is the research support on what effective writing instruction is um, and the same you know the same happened for the other the other two um, I think I think Janet Amberger found the the Guadalupe and Fletcher one, and Ingrid Stressinger found the other one, and both liked each of them liked what they read. So when the third and fourth grade teachers read them, and you know we were looking at them, we said, you know, this could be a nice compliment. So um, you know, it's it's a lot it's, it's a lot of groundwork that you know we don't like to jump into something too quick or something that's gimmicky. So we also look for who who's been robust in the field, um, you know, that that we we trust and you know, what, what the research is backing up. One other comment, too. Uh, Kelly alluded to the fact that teachers have been talking about this and reading on their own, but having a teacher leader position has been a catalyst for it. We don't have time to do these things to get together and get the resources and do that. So that's, that's been a big push, too. You can tell this doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. But, so I think the impetus was there, the willingness to work was there, but this, this is Kelly, thank you so very much for the report. We appreciate your work. We appreciate the work of the other faculty members who are here. And we would you please pass that comment along to all the other folks that have been involved in the program. With that, we'll move on to committee reports and begin with finance. Kathy? I feel anticlimactic after this. <laughs> Um, I'll start the uh, Finance Committee report with uh, just a report um, on a meeting that the Finance Committee attended last week on February 3rd. The Town Council Finance Committee was getting together to talk about the CPI and I invited the school board finance or school board to come um, and uh, participate. And the outshot of that was that the uh, Town Council Finance Committee agreed to recommend to the town council a budget cap equal to the CPIU for a 12-month period ending December 04, which is a number of 3.3%. The Finance Committee uh, met at 7 o'clock this evening, just before the school board meeting, where we signed warrants and reviewed appropriations reports. We also um, re reviewed the Food Service Task Force report. Um, we have still been meeting on a monthly basis. For those who were taking notes last month, um, the negative student accounts last month totaled $7,087.84. Uh, 
We lost a little bit of ground this month. Uh, we're at $7,709.30. We um, have just sent um, a group of accounts to a collection agency after multiple notifications um, and um, options to make payment plans were not followed. We also uh, received from the state, I think, is it Bob, the um, um, information on our per meal cost for lunch, which is something we've been trying to get our hands around for a while. The average for October, November, and December was $2.11 for a per meal lunch cost for Cape Elizabeth. Uh, we're currently charging $1.75 for a lunch and we received 25 cents from the state for a total of $2. So we do have that information. We've been trying to get it for a while um, and we'll be reviewing that in the future um, when we're discussing the lunch costs again. Um, the next item we discussed was an update on the state subsidy. Bob, did you wanna say anything about that or? Uh, only that we, um have received word since our last meeting that um, we're gaining uh, a we, that the town of Cape Elizabeth um, will get, or is anticipated to get uh, 50 some odd thousand dollars more than we uh, were originally notified of. Um, that um, information is helpful, but we are still waiting to get more specific information on how it breaks down and what is for some of the specific costs <coughs> Gary Lenoy was talking about, like technology, and what's for other things. Um, and uh, we hope to get that this Friday at a meeting. And the numbers we have are still preliminary, is that correct? Thank you. And uh, the last item was the Athletic Boosters 0304 report. Um, which Pauline uh, supplied to us, which was supplied to her. Um, and it was a general overview of the, um, of the boosters fund. And <coughs> we're going to be uh, looking at that in terms of a little more of a breakdown at our next meeting. Did I miss anything? Thank you. Move on to policy and policy committee met on February 1st. Under old business, we discussed the memorial policy, which will be, um, which we actually broke into two different policies, memorial events, and the second being memorial scholarships and gifts, and this will be presented later this evening for first reading. And the second item was to get an update on our B policies. That is board governance, the board governance section, and um, some of the B policies will also be presented later tonight for first reading. Under new business, we continue to review section I, that's the instruction section. We reviewed three separate policies, policy ICB, extended school year services, policy ID, time on task, and policy IGA, curriculum development. Um, we will continue working on those in upcoming meetings. And then finally, um, the school board members met, uh, some of the school board members met to discuss our board committee structure, which we will continue working on um, down the road. Um, and that's pretty much it. The communication committee, Rebecca. We met on January 19th. Um, some of the topics that we discussed was um, trying to perhaps, in, in relations to improving communication between students and the board, um, encouraging perhaps school board attendance at the high school student council meetings. And I will be endeavoring to um, speak with or contact Dwight, um, Eli, to learn about the schedule. And I'll share that information with the school board members. Um, Trish uh, has been working very hard on the school board informational brochure. We um, took some of the suggestions of the school board and included some meeting information, um, um, referencing opportunities for the public to participate, and referring to the website as an information source. I believe all of you have received a copy of that. Um, comments should have been made by now, and I think, Trish, if I'm correct, we're 
at the final stages. Just a waiting comment. Waiting comments from the school board. Okay, once we get those comments, we should be um, at a final draft. Um, we will seek to have school board committee information included on the website upon completion of the committee definitions and the work of the policy committee. Uh, we, we think that that would be some useful information to the public to have. Um, the committee is continuing to request that all school board meetings prepare agendas and publish minutes in a timely fashion. And we are taking uh, this month and the month of March to propose goals and objectives for the committee that will be reviewed and approved by the school board. That's it. Any questions? Thank you, Rebecca. Finally, personnel committee whose uh, primary function at this point is the superintendent search. Um, we have 12 applicants, Bob, 12 complete applicants in house. Um, all of the members of the school board have been in this uh, past week to review all of the applications and rate them individually. We will be meeting an executive session tonight in an effort to identify semi-finalist candidates and we hopefully we will begin interviews next week. The other item of business we have is to review the applications for the resident members of the uh, semi-finalist interview committee. Um, once those people have been selected and notified, we'll notify the public of who they are. There will be at this point no notification of who the semi-finalist candidates are um, in accordance with the main state law uh, protecting candidates. Questions? Great. Um, we have nothing under the category of other? Apparently <coughs> not. We have no unfinished. We have no unfinished business tonight. Um, so we're going to move under on to item 11, new business. And the first, I think, Bob, will you? Sure. Um, so we'll speak to that. Uh, to consideration for those at home, consideration of recommendation to extend the appointments of officers and um, subcommittee representatives until the first school board meeting following the November 2005 election. Um, as people, in, most people in town know, that there was a, uh, a ba an item on the ballot to move all elections to November. Uh, there used to be June, I believe, May elections or May. June May. May elections at which uh, school board members and some others were were um, elected. Um, with that change, since that did pass, um, that means that uh, there will not be another election now until next November, and therefore we need to extend. Um, we did extend terms of people, but we didn't extend their committee appointments and the leadership appointments. And uh, we probably should do that to be legal from uh, from June on, or May on, I guess. We have two elective positions on the board um, that are under consideration. That's myself as chair and Ann Belden as vice chair. All of the other committee's um, appointments are too numerous to list, but uh, essentially Rebecca is chair of communications, uh, Anne is chair of policy, um, Kathy is chair of finance, and those are our major committees, and I also chair uh, the personnel committee. So I would entertain a motion um, to extend all of all the appointments and terms until November 2005. So moved. Thank you, Henry. A second. Elaine, thank you. Any conversation? In that case, all in favor? Opposed? Motion <coughs> carries 7-0. Um, 
The next item is the superintendent's recommendations for athletic fee positions. Bob, would you read those into the record? Yes, we have some from both the middle school and the high school. Uh, the ones from the middle school are uh, Sarah Haskell for middle school swimming, Rob Yakabaskis, I hope I pronounced that right, for middle school Nordic assistant, and Muzzy Barton for middle school Nordic assistant. Um, at the high school, we have Ben Raymond for uh, varsity, these are all for spring sports. Ben Raymond for varsity boys lacrosse, Sarah Kinsella for varsity girls lacrosse, Andy Strout for varsity boys tennis, Ben Putnam for assistant boys tennis, Jamin Mooney for varsity girls tennis, Todd Day for varsity baseball, Joe Hendrickson for varsity softball, Sam Coughlin for JV softball, and David Weatherby for track. We have a motion. I move that we approve the athletic fee position as presented. Thank you, Trish. A second? Rebecca, thank you. Any conversation questions? Kathy? Is this some... Um this, uh, the middle school coaching position says there are new coaching nominations. Does that mean they add to the budget? Does that they mean they add to the board? Pardon me? They were not coached, coached before. They were not coached here in Cape Elizabeth before. Okay, but is this, I mean, it's I'm not a new position. It's just a new coach for that position. Oh, okay. So it's already, it's already. Thank Everything's you. been budgeted. Thank you. Okay. Any other <laughs> questions or comments? A motion, please. We already have one. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, we do. I apologize for my stuffy head. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Seven, motion carries 7 to 0. Okay. Consideration of superintendent's recommendations for co curricular fee positions. Bob? Yes. Um, there are four, and these, these are all budgeted as well. Um, Jill Bell to complete the position of video conference coordinator. There was a letter from Nancy Hutton in your package regarding that. And then three dealing with theater, um, the theater management, um, Dick Mullen, the theater assistant, <coughs> Peter Bloom, and the tech director set design, Deb Riccio. Um, somebody had asked about the hours on those, and I did give you a sheet. Um, earlier tonight, but theater manager is 100 hours, theater assistant is 150 hours, and tech director set design is 135 hours. And that's it. That's it. Can I have a motion, please? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Elaine? Um, I move that we um, um, support the superintendent. <coughs> Superintendent's recommendation for the co-curricular fee position. Thank you. A second. Thank you, Trish. Any conversation questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. On to the first reading uh, of the B section of policies and memorial policies, Anne. Okay, so we have about I don't know, 10 or so policies under the B section, which again is board governance. Um, all of these policies that we're going to be discussing tonight are, um, are either, they're all existing policies, and we've either made minor changes or revisions or additions or deletions. In a couple of cases, there, um, the policies that are in your packet, there are no changes at all. So we're going to go through these one by one so that people can follow what, what we're doing. The first one is policy BCA, School Board Code of Ethics. Is there any questions, comments, discussion around this policy? Terrific. Let's move on. Okay. The next one is policy BCB, Board Member Conflict of Interest. This is one of the policies that um, we're not making any changes of any sort, any additions or deletions. Um, I just want to comment that 
This is this policy and the one following, the nepotism policy, policy BCC, were two policies that we addressed in depth uh, last year over several policy committee meetings. And we did say at that time we approved these two policies in April, and we did note at the time that we wanted to, um, that the policy committee would do a review of these two new policies and just see how it was working um, after a full year had passed because there had been some changes that we did vote um, to approve last April when we changed these two policies. So that will be on the policy committee's agenda um, in April to take a look at. Any comments or questions? I, I'm not quite sure I understand, Anne. You said it's going to come up for review in April. We just we said last year when we approved these that we would in a year we would just review and just make sure that um, there there were some concerns I think the most um, notably there was a concern about coaches and the impact that these policies would have on the hiring of coach coach availability in the area and so we said that we would be sure to take a look at that and see if there had in fact been any impact one way or another. So this isn't, in, it's in the packet at the first reading? You know, it really, to tell you, it, it was kind of an oversight. We shouldn't have really had this in here. It doesn't require a first or second reading because we're not making any changes on it at this point. Okay, but we're discussing it at the <coughs> April policy meeting. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Next one is policy BDE board, board committees. You can see that there are a number of changes that are in red that the policy committee is recommending. Any questions I, about those? Yeah, I, I have a question about um, B. Uh, it says the committee members shall be appointed by the board chair. Um, the communications committee has a number of members that are teachers that volunteer to serve. I don't know if that would put them this committee in conflict then with this policy as it's written. And um, so we might want to either change the language to allow for volunteer members from the schools. Um, but perhaps you can talk about that in the next yeah. policy yes. committee meeting. Okay. I'd like to suggest that if this policy is in fact adopted, I will then turn around and appoint those existing members of committees who are not currently appointed. Okay. Okay, so we'll we'll take a we'll note to take a look at that, Rebecca, right. at our next meeting and explore what impact that might have. Also, um, for C the committee shall be provided with a list of its specific functions and duties. I don't know if it's appropriate or this is the place to do it to make accommodation for committees to offer um, suggestions, additions, changes for approval by the board. Because often they will have a better sense of mm -hmm. what the changing needs and demands are for the various committees. Okay, so that would be, I mean, that makes sense. That would be something else that we'd want to mm -hmm. possibly include in that. Establishing goals. Anything else? That's it. Great. Okay, policy BE school board meetings. Any questions, thoughts on this one? I had a question about the, you, you've taken out the second Tuesday of each month. Did you just not want to be held to that in yeah. case we want to change it to something? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Policy BEA, school board use of electronic mail. I have a question about that one too. Um, under C, it says board members, at one point it said should, shall, avoid, and I, I guess I didn't know the difference between should and shall, and then I thought, well, um, maybe it should say board members will avoid reference 
um, not should or shall, but must, or, or something along those lines. Um, because I don't think that there's any point in time when board members actually should be referencing confidential information. So shouldn't it say something like board members must avoid reference to confidential information? Yeah, I mean, I think that the difference between should and shall is that should sort of implies that you're saying that they ought to, but they don't necessarily have to, which is why we put the shall. And that's why I'm, that's why my question is exactly what you just said. They, sh they, they ought to, but aren't necessarily aren't necessarily held to, and I guess I'm saying, shouldn't they be held to? Um, I think shall is the syn a synonym to will, and I think that just it's in there just because that was what Drummond Woodson had recommended. Okay. All right. So you're you're saying board Sh members shall. With you. Shall. Shall, does shall mean well. you will. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sort of as a synonym. Thank you. Didn't mean to. I just okay. didn't quite understand. No, your point is well taken. Thanks. Anything else on that one? Oh. Policy BEC executive sessions. Any questions on this? Did this come from MSMA or from Drummond Woodson? Drummond Woodson. And then we have BECE, which is an exhibit, executive session law. Yep. Well, first you have BEC, which is being recommended to be replaced. It's replacing, it's the new B. There's two BECs. Two the short BEC, and then there's the longer one that's being replaced. Right. And then there's BECE. Are there any questions on any of those? Okay. This doesn't give us any Next one is policy B E D B agenda. Uh, I would encourage us to be specific as to where agendas are posted mm. um, because this is an important method of communication to the public um, and I, I would actually advocate that we make sure that agendas are posted in the schools and if we actually say it in the policy then maybe it would actually happen on a, a regular basis. So it's just a suggestion I have. I had the same concern when it says copies of the agenda will be posted. Um, that didn't say enough to me. It said, I mean, I need to know in the policy where it's going to be posted. I think it needs to be spelled out and, you know, it might be still a general something, but will be posted doesn't say, does, it's, it's incomplete. So we're wanting specifics as to locations? Do we want we something? be wild, say, but, yeah. you know, some, I mean, if it's the superintendent's office or if it's the hallway mm -hmm. or something, I mean, you don't have to say it's going to be posted in 400 places, mm -hmm. but but something about where it's going to be posted. What well, about the website? What about? Yeah, I, I think you can't go wrong by including where, where at a minimum, we want the agendas posted. And that way, we're guaranteed a, a minimum level of communication with the public. OK, so do we, um, all right, so what we can do is at the next meeting, we'll talk about where we would like to have it posted. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Mary, could you just fill in on where they're posted now? I know they go to all of the press. They go to... They go to all the, the newspapers. They po They go to the Courier, the Current, the Forecaster, the Portland Press Herald, the um, Cape Courier. They're posted on the website. They're posted at the library. They're posted at Town Hall in the... In the, in the town offices, in the hallway of the s going upstairs, and in the school offices. Um, and that's, they go to the teachers association. They go to the teachers association. They go to all the administrators. Yeah. Uh, they, 
So I guess the question That's is, just so you know. Do we want, know. do we want, I mean, are people feeling like they would like all those places listed in the policy? No, I mean, I think that's a conversation to be reserved for the yeah, policy yeah. committee meeting. Well, I wasn't asking where. I was just trying to get a feeling for, I mean, if they if, if everybody wants all the places listed, then we can put that together. But if and we're just, just talking about it. I mean, you're talking, she was talking about the different newspapers. If you said post it to the press, you know, that would be more of a, a global type of thing. Yeah, but I'm, I mean, I understand. We'll talk about it another time. <coughs> I'm super Can I just make one? Um, this is comment BEDB. We, we now have two copies. We did post, we did note in red the policy subcommittee is recommending that the school board accept the recommendation of Drummond, Woods, and McMahon. Do we want to put, like we've done on the others, a delete on the second page just so we know it's coming out? I know that's kind of technical, but we've put delete on all the pages where we're actually taking it out. We did not do that on this. I just thought it might be easier when we're going through, going mm -hmm. forward. I think we should. That, so that it doesn't get missed. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, the next one is BEDG minutes. Actually, this one, we're also not, we didn't, oh, yes, there are. I'm sorry. Yeah, there are. Okay. <coughs> Questions on this? Nope. Okay. Policy B E D H public participation at board meetings. Yeah, I'd just like to suggest under B, it says speakers are to identify themselves by name and address. Okay, so on the on the so the first one is the deleted policy. The one behind it is what we're proposing. So I'm sorry, Rebecca, you're saying under B we want to add possibly address, right? So B by name and address. Right. Yep, they're deleting the first thing and giving us the correction. Okay, any other thoughts on that? Oh, hey, it, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Ann. Um, it, board, on the same B, uh, board members wishing to address the speaker are asked to direct their comments through the board chairperson. Um, our practice has been if somebody's speaking and we have a question that we have ask them directly versus asking the chairperson, the chairperson asks it. I, I didn't know if that was something that we were actually actively looking to change or if that was still an okay practice. I'm just thinking of in terms of, you know, if we're all saying Kevin, 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 and then Kevin turns around and asks the same question to the speaker, if, if that's not flowing well. And, may, and maybe it was just an oversight when you were looking it over. At, at I don't remember time. discussing that. Does anybody oh, else? Frankly, I don't feel the need to have questions channeled through me, although I do feel the need to have responses directed to me and to be able so as to limit conversation. Well, as the chair, you know, you, all, yeah. you always have that option. Exactly. Just thinking about the flow of the actual question asking. So maybe it makes more sense to just take that off. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Just a kind suggestion. Of, yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other thoughts on that policy? <clears throat> All right, policy BG, uh, board policy development. This one, we're suggesting that we delete and replace it with the one behind it, yep. school board policies. Any questions on this? Nope. Um, policy BGB, policy adoption and amendment. Again, Drum and Wisdom has um, recommended that we delete this because there are guidelines behind policy BG that addresses this. 
Any thoughts on that? Are you, are you asking for comments on BGR? Well, no, right now we're just on BGB. BGB. Okay, so just the, the deletion of it. Yeah. So moving on, we're to BGR, which are guidelines on policy BG. So it's policy adoption and amendment procedures. Any uh, comments on this one? Did, did you answer the question under the note if members of the public? A. Oh, my, did I skip ahead? No. Yeah. Mine says under A, mm -hmm. know, members of the public, staff, or students have policy suggestions. Are they supposed to direct them to the superintendent or board members? And there's a question mark. That is a, addressed somewhere in there. Um, We're supposed to cross to the, the, it goes to the policy mm -hmm. committee. All right. So we need to take that question out. Yeah. Only retype it. I think that Mary takes all of those out when it's retyped for the final. I'll take yeah. it right out. I think what the question is getting at is that there is no mention of how someone from the public, staff, or students would proceed if they had any policy suggestions and that perhaps we may want to consider including some language that would address that. Well, I think that's what was done at the beginning there yeah. with members of the public added where it goes into the Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Right. It's red. I'm sorry. <coughs> I didn't see that. Okay, any other thoughts on this policy? Nope. Are these guidelines? Policy BIA, new board member orientation. Just one minor change in here. Any comments on that? Okay, then that's it for the B policies. Right. Moving on to the... Um, Two new policies. The first is policy FFAA, Memorial Scholarships and Gifts. And policy FFA, Memorial Events. These are, these are new policies. Jeff has worked on these in depth. Um, he worked with the high school crisis response team <coughs> group that originally came and asked the policy committee to um, to develop policies on this. So it's been a, a good process and this is what a group of people have put together. And I think it's great. Any comments or thoughts? Okay. Great, thank you. That concludes the first readings. Now we are back to another opportunity for public comment and seeing no members of the we, public no, present. We have E and F. Oh, so. well, we do. And F. F. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. E is consideration of a proposal to endorse project graduation activities for June 2005. Um, this is a request that came to us some time ago um, because um, in reviewing project graduation and the people who are doing it this year, they discovered that they are not covered under our insurance policy. And Pauline did go to our insurance company and find out what we had to do. And basically, unless it's an endorsed program by the school board, it does not come under um, our insurance. The simple way to solve that is to endorse it. Um, I think it's a good program. I think many of us have had um, youngsters who have gone through project graduation evenings um, where there are activities to keep them from driving, to keep them from being out drinking, um, and, and uh, other, other things they might be doing um, that at least lots of people used to do and we used to lose a lot of kids. 
um, graduation night. Um, Jeff uh, said for, that for this time, that it would be fine for the future if we're going to endorse it. They would like to have it a little closer to home, so if there are any problems, they can be uh, dealt with a little more easily, but would be willing to go along with what they're planning for this time, and that would be fine. So with that as background, um, I am recommending that we endorse um, project graduation for this year, that it be done on an annual basis, and that um, that um, that I think what was the amount that it would have cost them to get their own insurance? I think 600. it was 600. Okay, I don't know that. 600. What's it? Okay, 600 dollars or so. But that is an unnecessary expense, and there are kids, even though they will have basically graduated, you know, shortly before this activity takes place. So moved. A second. Elaine is secondary. It's a second. Okay. Comments, questions, concerns? Will we endorse it every year or? Well, I think that's what the plan is at this point because they are, the kids, this, the graduating class are not only leaving town, they're leaving the state. Um, and the plans are already pretty much in concrete. Next year is a condition of endorsement out of state is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. I believe that's the, the vision. Um, and we may want to develop um, at some point policy relative to this this type of uh, what what needs to be done in order to be endorsed. Right, and that way, that way it, you still have control over it um, as to whether you're going to do an endorsement or not, depending on what they choose to do. And they would know that up front if you go. There. What I, what I would envision basically, Elaine, is something similar to the, uh, the trips out of the country, the yeah. academic trips out of the country, so that we would be presented with a first request and then the plan and then endorse it or suggest what we have problems with. And it would be on a timeline. Right, that exactly. Early. Yeah. Yeah. So everything could be done. And, Yes, Jeff. I just wanted to say I think it's a good thing that um, Gareth is not here because the students don't know what they're doing. Right. <laughs> um, and it could, oh. get a, it could get a little bit, well. We have not been specific. Um, yeah, no, I know that. We'll try to be no more specific. I know that, but in terms of thinking about how it gets presented in the future, mm. that, that could get a little bit awkward, so it requires yep. a little bit of thought. But Although there could be broad guidelines. Yeah. Right. Well, there goes the trip to Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that's not where they're going. <laughs> okay. A vote. All in favor? Opposed? Happy graduation. <clears throat> Bob, um, item F. Yes. Um, the. Uh, I think I distributed this to you just a little earlier, but according to uh, the, the main state law, the deadline for receipt of written school board notification of renewal or non-renewal to principals employed for more than two years, whose contract expire in 2005 is March 1st. That's the reason we put this on this agenda as our last meeting until then. Um, therefore, it's practice to include all of our district administrators under the provision and notify them of their contract status for the coming year by March 1st. In order to do that, the school board needs to consider this now. Uh, it was inadvertently left off the agenda. And uh, the list, of course, includes only two principals, um, Tom and Jeff, the assistant principals, John and Mark, and district-wide, Claire, Pauline, Gary, Sarah, Keith, and Sue Weatherby. Uh, I know that um, there is not there has not been the negotiations on salary as yet. This does not set a salary. It simply uh, notifies them that they would be returned. Okay. 
i move that we support the superintendent's recommendation for the nominations to administrative positions for the two thousand and five two thousand and six school year thank you a second trish thank you any discussion if we put nancy's name back on it does that mean she has to stay well we could try she's not going to work but she'll take the money that's what i was afraid i told you nancy we're up to lots of different things no good i i know Rebecca? Yeah, I'm very puzzled by the process of this. Have reviews, performance reviews been performed? And we're saying we're going to renew contracts before they've been performed? I, I'm not going to be an obstructionist, but I think that this brings up a very large question mark in my mind as to the way this is done. It just is illogical to me. And I would, I would like to ask, um, Bob, that you take a close look at the timing of reviews, when we have to renew contracts, and make them fall much more in line with, I think, a standard practices. Well, and that's, um, you know, when I asked, because I didn't know when they were done, uh, last year they were done just before the end of the year. And that doesn't make a lot of sense to me either. But that's something that you are going to have to look at as, you know, with your new superintendent as to um, when might they be done. If I had done written reviews, I would still be making these same recommendations. Yeah. Um, because I, you know, I think all of these people are very deserving of that. Yeah, and, and, but, and, and that's where I'm going on. Uh, but I have not done written, written reviews of them. Yeah. I don't disagree, but it's an issue I'd rather tackle with a permanent superintendent in place. Because although I highly respect Bob's opinion on these, these issues, certainly there may be some subtle differences when we have a permanent superintendent in place. So um, your point is well taken. And I believe it is really more in the realm of the board's purview to make the determination in, in conjunction with the superintendent how we operate that. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Do you think that the, the new superintendent is going to be able to do that in, a, in his or her first year? Um, yes. Okay. Mary, can you please put on your calendar um, some sort of memorandum or note to file um, so that when we do have a new superintendent in place, um, that issue will, we will remember to raise that issue before it's a problem? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Rebecca, for what it's worth, we discussed it last year, too. and it, it, I mean, it's not just this isn't the first time it's been discussed. It's been talked about already it's just hasn't made it to the forefront and it was one of my concerns last year because I come from a background where you have to do that or you can't you know f go forward so I yeah. understand what you're saying all right any other questions discussion concerns I believe we have a motion and a second. Somebody help me because the head's getting stuffier by the minute. We were comments. Thank you. In that case, all in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Watch out. All right. Um, finally, public comment. There is no public here to comment. So we'll move on to school board agenda requests. And to the best of my knowledge, there were no requests made through the leadership team. Therefore, there is should be no um, appeal of the request that were denied. Is that correct? Correct. 
Representative Wass, can you explain? Yeah. Yeah, this is something that we decided to do at our board retreat, and unfortunately, it never appears on the agenda and <coughs> until I, Bob or I catch it at the end of a meeting. So um, I wanted to make sure that it was on the agenda to remind everybody that they have that option. Okay, so it, it would be done at the meeting. This meeting. That if someone or the next meeting. If someone requested something be put on the agenda and it did not appear, then they would okay. like to bring that to the entire board. Yeah, and that was, we sort of agreed to a process on that, although I'm not sure that we ever put it down on paper, and I, I think we need to do that. But um, I wanted that back on the agenda um, as a reminder to each of you that you had the right, that particular right of appeal. Is that something that should go on the agenda policy? Perhaps. I don't really know. Good point. Take a look at that. Rebecca. That finishes that. And finally, superintendent has proposed that we enter executive session to consider a personnel issue related to the superintendent search pursuant to one MRSA, I don't know what this symbol means, 405, <laughs> 6A, um, I have a motion? So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Elaine, thank you. Any discussion? Let's in that go. case, all in favor? Opposed? <laughs> have a three -fifths. Don't, don't write don't that. Don't play around. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Nancy, I don't know if it counts, but I wrote you on my oh, list. Okay. After